All right, everyone. Well, this is Sandcast Beach Volleyball with Tri Born and Travis Moore. Or Tri is uh, not joining us today because he is out competing in the Stad Four Star, and it's like uh, two in the morning there, so he, he couldn't make this one work. But uh, we got uh, Derek Olsen, who just came back uh, from overseas uh, from Morocco, joining us today. How we doing, dude? Doing good. Hanging in there. Yeah, it uh, the jet lag is is no joke with the the eight hour time difference. When did you get back from Morocco? Last night, last night. So we traveled. We were actually in France, which is nine hours ahead. Okay. Um, so we got in late last night. Actually, got some good sleep. Um, feeling feeling good so far. Yeah, and uh, can you just give us a rundown of of what what you were doing uh, in Morocco? And, uh, and then we'll, we'll kind of backtrack and, and figure out how, how you ended up coaching there. Yeah, I'll try and, I'll try and give you the summary. Yeah. Um, and then you can pick apart which part you want to dive into. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so the setup kind of went like this. So our season finished at Cal. And then me and my wife took a week. It wasn't really vacation because we were working. Right. But we went and saw my mom. And she lives near Zion in Southern Utah. Okay. So we went and visited her because it had been a while since I had seen her during COVID. Um, and then we were actually about to hike the Narrows in Zion when Stein Metzger from UCLA calls me um, out of the blue and just says, hey, uh, I was thinking of you. Um, I got a call about Morocco needing a coach for their national teams uh, trying to get to the Tokyo Olympics. That was about all he gave me. And I was like, okay, I'm interested because I'm always, always up for an adventure. Yeah. And so I told him I was interested. Uh, he gave me Donald Sujo's number, the former Olympic setter. Uh, yeah. So I was talking with him a lot about it. He basically w- was saying, yeah, so they're looking for a coach. Um, you know, if you're interested, I can kind of put you in contact. So I worked with him a little bit, um, just trying to find out some details, but I wasn't getting much. So basically he came <laughs> yeah. back, he's like, all right, send me a proposal. Like, what would it take for you to go? And I was basically like naming my price at that point. Yeah. So, um, and then from there, we were kind of off and running. <clears throat> it was really crazy. It was really last minute. Um, I think we were home for maybe a week after that. And in the, the conditions, so I, so then I started talking to, um, this lady who's the head of the Federation of Morocco and she was basically, you know, saying like, how soon can you get out here? We need American teams. Uh, who do you know? Who can you bring out? And so I was trying to figure out my own flight over and, and, uh, you know, my wife was coming with me. That was like one of the conditions I was like, my yeah. wife's coming, <laughs> you gotta have, you know, it's gotta be safe and clean. Like, that's all I care about. You yeah. Know? And so so anyways, we ended up out there um, and then I was out there for five weeks total, but three weeks we were training the men and the women. Uh, the fourth week was the competition itself. And then fifth week, I took my wife to Paris. So, um, so you finally got like, your vacation. That was our vacation. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I had promised her a long time ago that I'd take her to Paris. So we got yeah. that opportunity, which was pretty cool. Well learned too. It was probably kind of a pretty sweet vacation because I mean, you came to Morocco and you guys won the Continental Cup for the men anyway and, and got an Olympic berth. Like, what a trip. You said you're always up for an adventure. <laughs> you got one. Yeah. yeah, this was this was up there um, for sure. But yeah, I think a lot of people thought that I was maybe uh, coaching and kind of vacationing at the same time, but it was anything but that. I was working essentially overtime while I was out there. I bet. So the, yeah, the week in Paris, uh, well, France, we were in Nice before Paris, um, was much needed for sure. I bet. Yeah. So when, I mean, when you get the call to, to go coach the Moroccan national team, um, like what, what's step one, when you get boots on the ground, like who, how do you, cause I mean, it's not like you've been working with these guys, you know, for years and you can just step in and like, all right, like the program's running itself. Like you're just meeting these guys with four weeks left before the biggest tournament of their lives yeah i mean i was scouring youtube trying to figure out like (laughs) if i could like get any film on them um so one thing i noticed really quick was there i mean there was not a lot of 
planning, communication happening. So I was trying to scrape for anything. Um, you know, I was trying to, I was trying to get as much intel as possible about, you know, like, what is the setup going to be like? Am I the head coach? Am I the assistant coach? Like, what's that environment like? How right. many players do I have? What's the format of this tournament? What's the training schedule? Is that my, am I coming up with all that? I, I literally knew basically nothing. <laughs> like before I stepped foot uh, on ground, I basically knew nothing. Um, I didn't even know who's going to pick me up from the airport until I was already on my flight. It was wild. So it was, it was a scramble um, day one when we got there. Yeah. And then so you ended up being, I'm assuming you were just the head coach. Yeah. And then was it, was it just you or were there a couple guys there that could help you out? Yeah, there was, we had other coaches. So it, it, it's still, I still don't know. And that's the funny thing is I'm still like kind of confused about what the arrangement was um, because I'm speaking with the president of the Federation and she was, uh, she was actually quarantining because she was coming back from Egypt. So I didn't see her until, you know, maybe week two of the whole process. Um, and I was talking with the other coach. So they, they have a coach. Um, I don't know why they felt like they, they just felt like they needed to bring somebody else in. And so I, when I, when I got there, I was trying to figure out, am I, the, am I running the show here? Am I running practices? I'm assuming I'm going in, assuming that I am. Um, they even at one point asked if my wife coaches and I'm like, well, she can help. She doesn't, but she's played <laughs> like thinking that, all right, we, am I bringing my wife in the coach? <laughs> yeah. So they had, a, um, you know, there's a technical director and I don't even know what he does, but I think he handles logistics. There, there's a lot of staff yeah. and to figure out everybody's a president, everybody's a director. Um, super confusing. I had, a, the, so the Rashid was the other coach okay, and barely spoke any English. And, you know, day one, he, you know, tells me to just run with it. And so it was kind of clear, like at that point, all right, I, I am running the practices. This is my show. And, and the president, her name is Madame Boucher. She was, uh, you know, she told me in the beginning, like, you're the head coach, just like do the training. And so I kind of went in with that. But yeah, we had, we had help. Um, I was just trying to figure out, you know, what everybody's role was. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, you were there for, for the Continental Cup. Um, so were you just coaching, was it two men's teams, two women's teams, or were there a couple others just as, as training teams too? Yeah. So for the first three weeks we had three, so we had six Moroccan men's players and six Moroccan women players. Okay. And the men were kind of already paired up because they have a, you know, they have a team, their top team was established. Um, and then the women we were trying to figure out pairings for. So, um, and then we brought in uh, Ia Lindahl and Jessica Gaffney because um, they wanted, that was a whole nother ordeal, but they wanted um, tra training teams and, and asked me if I could bring in the Americans. So it's like, okay, like I got a lot on my plate right now, but I'll try and figure out if we can bring, you know, some teams out. It ended up falling through on the men last minute. Kind of feel bad for the guys I was talking with about that logan weber was going to come out um uh, he would have he's oh that's the guy who's always up for an adventure too yeah he was bummed and i felt bad but i mean literally last minute I, i'm like asking for their passports thinking that they're literally going to book and then right. they told me um they're bringing out a guitar team or they brought out two men's guitar teams so so i had two guitar men teams and then um an american women's team come out so in total we had, I mean, this is, this is how a typical day went. We would go an hour and a half men's practice, hour and a half women's practice, like a three hour lunch break. And then an hour and a half men's practice, hour and a half women's practice. And it was just okay. like that. So I was on the, I was on the sand coaching six hours every day. And sometimes it was five teams for the men <laughs> trying to figure out sometimes on one court and then four teams for the women um just practice planning and stuff like that yeah so we did that for three weeks and then um for the actual tournament it was two men's teams two women's teams okay and then so that was the final stage of the african continental cup right 
Yeah, they actually combined the last two stages because they only got through one and a half stages. Okay. COVID hit. So yeah, they kind of combined too. Okay. So what was, how many teams were left then? And because I know like Norseka, they got it down to, I think the quarterfinals before their final push. The CEV was just had like a pretty much a full tournament. I think there were 16 teams left uh, in their final phase. How many teams were left in, in that bracket? So they actually opened it up again and they said, everybody that wants to compete can compete. Um, the teams that had already qualified for the second phase and gone through got um, buys out of the pool play. So they okay. already made it to like the playoff. So they had like pools that were supposed to be like the second round. Yeah. The last phase was the single in the bracket. And so like Egypt on the women, um, they didn't play any pool play. They were already in for the playoff. Okay. Cause I met, uh, so I met the, the Gambian guys, mm -hmm. um, Sedani and yeah. gosh, I forget, I forget the other guy's name. Um, I can't pronounce them, but yeah, yeah, but there, I mean, there were some, and then, uh, one of the Moroccan teams came to Doha. So when I played in Doha, there was Gambia and, uh, Morocco were there mm -hmm. and not bad teams. Like if I was looking at it like, Oh, Gambia, I thought it was going to be like seeing, you know, Guatemala and, and the Norseka where it's just like, but they were good. Like there's pretty good talent out there. Yeah. Africa. One thing that I learned pretty quick was, um, they're, they're so athletic, like, yeah so athletic but they just don't they don't understand you know kind of the disciplines of the game um but they have all the physical ability so yeah. it's just a matter of time before they catch up honestly yeah. and uh the moroccan defender i want to say his name was mohammed abicha yeah abisha abisha yeah. he's good he's just a, a cagey vet i really like that guy when i met him <laughs> yeah yeah, he's awesome. Um, such a character. They call it, I mean, they call him God out there. Cause he's really, like, yeah. Cause he's the one, <laughs> he's the only guy that plays year round beach. Yeah. Uh, and he's been, I think kind of the best beach player for a while. Um, yeah. So, I mean, jokingly, of course, but yeah. they. they yeah. Know. All right. So it, awesome. did, uh, did God qualify for the Olympics? Is he the yeah. one? So, he going? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So he's going. That's awesome. That's super cool. Yeah. Uh, I was stoked for him. Um, he's playing with this, this, uh, I guess I can call him kid. He's 26. His name is Zuhair. Um, he plays at the highest level. I think he's in France indoors. Okay. Um, as like an outside hitter, he's legit. Um, he's really smooth on the beach too. I don't know if he was playing when at the tournament that you were at in Doha. I don't know uh, if he's still playing indoor. Uh, the defender brought a different guy. I think his yeah. guy was playing indoor. Yeah, so he's legit. I mean, he he's a stud. He could he could develop real nice and be world tour player. Yeah. So are you just uh, Derek Olson, part time bear, part time Moroccan national team coach? <laughs> Dude, I, don't, I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. I mean, it's yeah, it was it was crazy. Uh, we'll see about the future, but um, I don't even know if they were expecting me. Like they still might be expecting me to like come back and coach. That's how funny the, the disconnect and communication is. But um, yeah, yeah, we'll see. We'll see if I get invited back. Yeah. I mean, pretty successful. So I know that, so the men qualified. Mm -hmm. Who'd you guys beat in the finals? Uh, Mozambique in the final. Okay. And then the women, it looked like we're what one, pretty much one swing away from qualifying. Yeah. So yeah, so we knew going in the women, it was going to be tougher for them because um, Egypt, who went to the last Olympics, was really strong. Um, Kenya was really strong. Uh, let's see who else. There, there was Rwanda. I mean, there's several women's teams that could have could have won it. I guess yeah. on the men's side, um, maybe not as deep. I think it was Morocco, Gambia. From everything that I was hearing going in, it was Gambia as the team to be. Yeah. Um, but Mozambique was good. Um, Ghana was good. Um, who else? Egypt was good. They almost beat us. Um, so yeah. And then the women had it. I mean, it was it was crazy. They so I guess for people that don't understand how the process works. Yeah. Um, which we can dive into. It's a whole nother thing, but basically you submit two teams in this, in the continental cup and team a plays team B from the other country. 
and your team B plays team A from the other country. And then if it's split, they go into a golden match. And then in the goal of the match, you could submit whoever you want, whatever team you want. Usually it's team A versus team A from the other country. Um, so kind of an interesting format. It's pretty fun actually, but I kind of knew, so I knew going in that, okay, we gotta have, we have to have a, a strong second team. Our, our top team, Abisha and Zuhair, they're well-established. Um, they know they can do it. They're kind of, they are what they are. Um, and not to say that I wasn't going to help them at all, but I knew that the team, the second team needed to play well because they right. were, they were going to get the first crack at everybody's top team. And if they could squeak out wins, then that would preserve us from having to play an extra match. Yeah. Um, and just reduce pressure. Originally it was going to be a golden set to 15 and then they changed it to a match. And I was, so I was really scared because anything can happen in, in a game of 15, right? It's crazy that they do one set. In any format, a golden set. That's crazy. Yeah, you might as well flip a coin. I mean, it's, I know. it's crazy. So I think they do that in North Sica, yeah? They did. Mexico, Canada finals went to a golden set. And I was like, because I didn't know that it was just a set. And so I was talking to one of my buddies um, from Canada. And I was like, all right, golden match, right? And he's like, no, one to 15. I was like, you got to be kidding me. An Olympic bid, you're playing one set to 15? And it's probably, if you think about it, team a playing team b it's probably going to that so that's like first time you have you know your top two teams playing and it's a game of 15 i don't like it i, I get it because it's a lot of matches if you play the golden match potentially but i mean that's you're fighting for an olympic bid so yeah you kind of don't i don't know you want the best team to go but anyways we're playing a golden match and i knew that if we had a strong second team they could be the top teams from other countries and keep our you know, Abisha is 41, I believe. Yeah. I'm like, we got to preserve him. <laughs> um, so I worked a lot with like the second team and there are a couple of 22 year old kids that play indoor club or professionally indoor in Morocco. Um, Sufian and uh, Usama are their names. So my, my intention from the beginning was develop these guys Let's get them, let's get them some wins. Like they're going to, they're going to seal it for us. And I kind of had that going in. Yeah. Um, and then same thing on the women's It was like, we need two good teams. Like it, it, it's going to be crucial to have two good teams, but um, yeah, like the way it played out, it was, it was, it was literally, I feel like, and this is me being biased because I was, you know, a part of the process, but to me, it was like a, a fairy tale movie, the way it played out, because it was like so perfect in how it just went the entire four weeks. I, I couldn't have drawn it up anymore, like beautifully, because I felt like, as I was saying, my intention was to get the second team good, and yeah. they're gonna they're gonna be huge for us. And so we're going into this tournament and they're all over the place. Like they're at wildly athletic, wailing balls out, like, <laughs> give up five straight points, score five straight points. It's like one of those things where you're just yeah. like, oh my gosh, there's like no consistency here. <laughs> um, but, but, I was, but I was like, I, I went in thinking, okay, they're, they're athletic, uh, you know, they, they just need to know. I was trying to grab the, the lowest bearing fruit first and just say like whatever I can find that will give them a quick fix. I'm not going to change their arm swing, you know, right before this big tournament. I'm not going to change the way they pass. They are what they are in a lot of ways, but we can work on mindset, um, you know, confidence stuff. And then we can, we can work on the disciplines of volleyball, like the, the stuff that once you're aware of it, it can help you instantly, you know? So a lot of, I mean, they were, they were staying wide on the right and I was having them kick in setting location they're trying to run all this like quick shoot sets quick you know i'm like i know you probably see it on YouTube, <laughs> whatever, but like we gotta get there first and so yeah. a lot of just changes like that um and uh you know with them i i knew that they, they had the physical gifts like they were really talented but they just needed to learn how to play the game the yeah. right way and so that was my focus and you know, it took a little while. There's a lot of trial, a lot of error. Um, and then as we went into the tournament, you know, they just, I could see them kind of going like this, figuring it out, you know, uh, getting better and better every day. And I just told them their time is coming, their time is coming. And so we, you know, we made it through pool play. 
um, pretty easily. All our teams won, men and women. And then we, I think our first round in, on the men's side was against Egypt, maybe? Yeah, it was against Egypt. That was our quarterfinal. And our second team almost beat their top team. They, they lost in three, I think. Um, they had chances and they were super bummed about it. Our top team ended up going three and barely winning against their top team. And we could have lost that. Like we could have been out, like the way it was going. Yeah. We were, we were tired, like it, it, we could have lost it. So anyways, at the end of that, I was telling them, hey, your time is coming. You're gonna get it, like no more golden sets like to the second team. I was like, you're gonna get it, you're gonna get it. So then we played Ghana in the semifinal, or not Ghana, uh, Gambia in the semifinals. Yeah. And, you know, in my head, I'm like, this is the one we need. Like this is, this could be the final, right? And I was thinking to myself, our second team needs to, win. I don't want to put a gold match. <laughs> needs, to, needs to win this. So Abisha, our top team wins straight sets. And then our second team have them on the ropes. And, and then at the very end, they just do, you know, stupid, stupid mistakes, play uncharacteristic, um, you know, like just kind of lose their cool in the moment. And they end up losing like 24, 22, 22, 20 or something like that. Really Battle. Cool. Um, and then, and then our top team beats them in straight sets in the golden match. And then we get to the finals and, you know, like that night, every night we have a, have a meeting as a team, uh, the men and the women, uh, separately, of course, but we go over film and we talk about game plans and that I, I loved, I loved that time with them because yeah. they were so invested in, and we were watching it. And then that's when, you know, we were saying like, no, we got this, like, this is, like, look at this. This is what. This is how we're gonna attack them. This is all we need to do. Whatever. And then that was kind of like the magical moments for me, at least. Uh, so we're going into the finals, and our top team goes three with Mozambique's second team. And I'm like, oh shoot, you know, like this is stressful. <laughs> right. they, you know, like it is so, so very stressful. And then, um, you know, I told them like before, I was like, dude, this is your moment. You're gonna clinch it. Like you got this. You know, and and it was, and this is why I say it was like, it felt like to me, it was like my own, like, you know, like uh, Disney movie where they played, <laughs> yeah. they played flawless. They, they did everything that we were working on in practice. They kept their cool, you know, everything that we had talked about. It was like the culmination of everything. And they were like down by one or two, the entire first set. And then they rattle off two points at the very end after being tied at like 19 all win 22, 19 or something like that. And then game two, they're neck and neck, and then they pull away in, in the second set. And you could just see it like happening for them. I mean, they played out of their minds, like perfect when they needed it the most. And they yeah. ended up pinching it. And it was like one of those, like, I blacked out when they when they won. I blacked out, rushed the court, was so happy for them. <laughs> um, you know, and then just seeing like like on their faces, like I think for the first time, because they don't have any beach experience. Like they had right. no beach experience. No, they've never been in th through anything like that and then to like win it for their country you know the the top team's going to the olympics but they won it for them essentially right. you know and so it was it was a really really cool moment uh to be a part of yeah i bet we're gonna pause here to take a quick second to shout out our sponsor wilson as always makers of the best balls in the game that's what we're playing with on the avp which Interesting news was just bought by Bally's Casino. So now we have a ton of interest in the AVP this year and a ton of interest, as always, in the best ball that we'll be playing with, Wilson Volleyball. Use our discount code SANDCAST-20 to get 20% off all Wilson products. That's volleyballs, that's carts, whatever Wilson you may need. Wilson SANDCAST-20 will get you 20% off. And now, back to the show. How... uh how do you guys decide because every country does it different who goes to the olympics yeah i think that i don't i mean i think in general it's your top team um i think most countries have a, a better team than you know they're not as even yeah um it was always going to be abisha and zuhair because yeah. they are i mean they're the better team yeah I mean, uh they have the best shot at doing something in the olympics for the women, I don't know, like, because we had two pretty even teams. We had an A team, B team, but it was really close. Yeah. 
So I don't know how we would have figured that out, to be honest. Yeah, because I know um, the Dutch, they did a one match playoff between their two women's teams. Um, I don't know if Mexico did a playoff. They did. Or they yeah. did? Okay. Because I mean, guys beat Juan and Lombard or, uh, Lombardo. Yeah. The young kids won it. Yeah. And then if Canada would have won, they would have had a, a playoff. So every, every country has a different system. Um, yeah, I guess, it, I guess we could have done whatever we wanted, but the men, it was decided the women, we might've done something like that. Yeah. Was, uh, is Nora Darhar on? Yeah. Okay. Cause she, she lived out here for a while. Yeah. So she, so I didn't even know, like the first practice, uh, I'm trying to, I'm fumbling my way through French because Arabic, I'm not even not even gonna touch that. <laughs> no. uh, trying to figure out, you know, names and and then all of a sudden this girl is speaking like perfect English back to me. I'm like, okay, wait a second. <laughs> like where <laughs> you know, she's like, Oh yeah, I lived in Manhattan Beach, you know, I'm friends with a bunch of the players. I'm like, oh okay, like perfect. Yeah, Internet translate everything for the men and the women. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, she was awesome. She helped me out, me and my wife out in so many different ways. <laughs> you know, on the court, off the court stuff. <laughs> Showed us around a little bit, but she was, uh, yeah, she had, she had just injured her shoulder. So she was kind of coming back from an injury. Yeah. Tough timing for that. Yeah. I know she wanted to be out there too. It was, it was tough, but yeah. How, uh, how was it though? I mean, just a, as a place, I mean, obviously I've, I've never been to Morocco and I don't think most of our listeners have. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it was awesome. I didn't know what to expect at all. Um, yeah. we were talking to, you know, my wife was Googling everything. Like, what is it like to be a woman in, you know, predominantly Muslim country? Right. Um, but it was fine. I mean, it, like, it was totally safe. We were very much taken care of. Um, we, we stayed all but one week. We stayed in really nice places, um, had really good care, felt safe the entire time um but yeah i mean it's just uh you know we kind of caught it at an interesting time too because they were just they were locked down pretty hard i think they were the hardest lockdown country in africa during covid okay and they had just lifted um a curfew that was 8 p.m and everybody eats late there you know so if you have a curfew at eight that destroys the restaurants yeah so when we had gotten there um they had just lifted that so everybody's, you know, out and about. Um, we stayed in this, in the capital city called Rabat. Okay. It's very, you know, business uh, central, a um, lot of like commerce going through there. And, and then it's right on the beach too. So we would practice every day, not on the beach, on the beach, but like a few meters away. Yeah. Um, but yeah, really cool country, good food, um, great people, very accommodating, very welcoming. Yeah. And then a, a very much earned vacation <laughs> for a week. Yeah. I bet that was nice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Paris, Nice. Yeah. That was, it was awesome. Yeah. Cause I mean, how much time did you have from, from the end of Cal season to uh, heading over to Morocco for the four or five weeks? Um, about three and a half weeks. Um, yeah. So, but you know, I feel like we weren't in season, but then, you know, you're doing other stuff, you're doing end of the year stuff, like, right. How job never stops, which, yeah. you know, technically, and I was going through, and I'm still in the hiring process. I don't, I don't even know if you know that, but so I, I was an interim head coach this last year. Yeah. So I'm still going through the interview process. I'm supposed to find out today or tomorrow, whether or not I'm actually going to continue on as head coach, but so I was doing interviews while I was out there, um, the whole application process, and then recruiting at the same time. So it was interesting. I I would spend like the first eight hours of the day coaching and then working the next eight hours of the day, which would have been like our nine to five, right? recruiting on Zoom calls and answering, you know, like doing the whole Jeez. Uh, or, uh, Cal job, the second eight hours of the day. So Man. You know, be working at the same time so it was literally <laughs> just work all day every day yeah that's a lot of volleyball <laughs> that's a lot of volleyball in the brain yeah it was a lot <laughs> it was a lot but you know i signed up for it so yeah. yeah i mean what a crazy year though so i mean you were the uh interim head coach 
um because megan awusu she had her, her triplets right yeah and then so you took over i mean how was that just like becoming head coach it's kind of a whirlwind year for you yeah i mean you couldn't it was difficult to plan anything you know we just we had to prepare for everything and couldn't really plan for anything. So, um, but, you know, we had more happen with our squad this last year, injuries, COVID protocol stuff um, than any other year combined since I've been there. Um, but we, you know, we, we did okay. We, I think we finished 11th in the ABCA poll and just kind of right around where we started. We were in it to go to NCAs until basically Pac-12 championships. Um, we had a bunch of good wins. Started, I think everybody played at some point. We had, so I, I forget, we had some crazy statistic, like eight players played for the first time this year. We were starting four true freshmen, two red shirt freshmen. We were like, had a few seniors and then everybody else freshmen. It was, yeah. it was nuts, but, um, you know, we grinded through it and, um, kind of held ground in our, and I feel like we, you know, we didn't achieve our goal of going to NCAs, but um, we kind of held our ground. We didn't get a fall. Like we didn't get a fall to train. We, us in Stanford, I think we're like the only schools in Hawaii that didn't, that didn't get a fall season. So it was weird, but you know, I was, I was proud of how we, you know, what we accomplished. Yeah. And for what it sounds like, you guys have a pretty bright future. I mean, with how young you guys were, like, like you mentioned, you beat some really good programs and you ended up, I mean, 11th, you guys were knocking on the door to go off shores. Yeah. Um, I, I thought, you know, throughout most of the season, maybe if not till the end, um, it was coming down to us, Arizona, Stanford. Um, and we had good wins, some unfortunate losses against good teams. I thought we were like really, you know, right there to take it, but yeah, the team is going to be really good next year. Like we've got good transfers coming in. We've got good freshmen. We've got Mima's coming back. Um, I feel like she's been there for like 10 years. <laughs> it seems like it, she's been on our ones since <laughs> the beginning. Um, yeah, so we're bringing in some studs from across the country. The, yeah, the, the team is going to be really good next year. Yeah. So I'm hoping that you know, I can stay on with them, but we'll see. Yeah. It's surprising. I mean, what's the, the job application process? It's not like you're some brand new guy. They, they found off zip recruiter. Like you've been there for a while. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, just, I don't know. Do you like what I've been doing or yeah, I don't like it, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, just being a, a state school, you know, they have protocol that they got to go through, but right. it's been over two months now. So okay. No, they don't seem to be in a rush. No. I guess you find out pretty soon. It could be, it could literally be tonight. I'm not sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, it seems like uh, whether Cal has decided or not, they, they like what you do. It seems like you love, I've really fallen in love with coaching. Um, mm -hmm. You've made a, a pretty, you made it like a pretty quick transition from player to, to full-time coach and, and you've done it well. I'm wondering what that transition has been like uh, for you. Yeah. Is it something that is in your future, Trav? Maybe. I, I love coaching and Delaney. I mean, she's, she's been coaching forever. Um, so I, it's, I have a blast when I do coach. You will just wait. <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, I think it kind of hit me. I didn't really, I thought I was going to be playing until I was like 40 competitive. Yeah. I was like, my body's not going to ever break down. I'm going to be, I'm going to be fine. And then of course my body started to break down a little bit. Right. Um, but I think the, the transition really happened when I, I kind of realized that what used to keep me up at night was what I was going to do as far as training, like the next day or like who I was going to play with or the next tournament or, or whatever. It was my own, my own game. That would, that was what kept me up at night. Right. And then for whatever reason, I was coaching kind of on the side at Coast Volleyball Club. And then all of a sudden I started like waking up and being like, what am I going to do for drills? For my girls tomorrow. You yeah. Know? It's just kind of like this weird transition. And, and then, you know, I found myself in the qualifier and I was like, well, this isn't good. <laughs> um, and then I actually wasn't even going to take the job at Cal, but I wanted experience. Um, I, I wanted the experience of going through the interview process. So 
I applied like last minute, like literally like right before midnight of the expiration uh, for application process. And then one thing led to another and I found myself at Cal and I was like, well, like, let's do this. Um, you know, let's start it. Let's see what uh, can happen with this. And then I can always come back to San Diego and, you know, and, and live out the rest of my life down here if I want, right. but let's try this. And so, you know, I, at that point I was in love with coaching. So I knew it wasn't, wasn't uh i wasn't trying to figure that part out it was just where right um, and then yeah like we had a good first year um i felt like i was you know uh doing some good things with the program and and then year two same thing improved year three i was acting head coach um and then year four interim head coach so the last two years i've been in this like pseudo head coach interim role and then yeah, here I am. But the transition was honestly easier than I thought. Yeah. I know when we had, we, we've obviously had a bunch of coaches who, and most coaches that we've had on were players. And Jose said that he had a tough time, um, kind of like he, he called it killing the player inside of him. But it, it seems like the coach inside of you kind of took over the player. Like what was keeping you up at night was no longer kind of your own playing stuff, but what you were going to do for the people you were coaching. Yeah. I, I know what he I know what he means by that. Um, when I was coaching, I've only coached boys for a little bit, but I've um, every time I coach boys, I have more of that. And and honestly, when I was coaching Morocco, I had I had more of that um, just because I was like, like this is what you need to do. Like I've you know I've I've been there. You yeah. Know? This is like how you're supposed to play the game or whatever. And I right. felt myself like like I was like wanting to jump in and like show them how to do stuff and like. I, I found myself in that role or with that mindset way more than I've ever felt coaching women and coaching, you know, high school girls. Right. Um, so, yeah, like I, I think if I had tr transitioned to coaching boys, it would have been harder, much harder. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that decision, cause you mentioned that you wanted to get into coaching for some experience, but I had to find out where that decision to go up to Northern California. Uh, I'm sure that wasn't, a super easy one, even though like Cal's a, a good school and a great opportunity. That was also a pretty big move from kind of the capital as a player. Was that a tough decision to make? Or was it kind of, was one of those where it was sort of obvious? No, it was tough. Yep. Um, so I like, you know, I found my now wife um, in San Diego and we had been dating. And, you know, I think at that point I'd already like fallen in love with her. So it was like moving away from her for a little bit moving away from San Diego, like I love San Diego. I, yeah. I was living, you know, a few blocks up. I was living in downtown Encinitas right by moonlight in the perfect location. So I felt like I was giving up a lot. Um, and, and the, the salary at the time for the assistant job was like 32,000, which cool. in the Bay area is going to like, <laughs> get you a like low minimum wage. <laughs> yeah. Like get you Chipotle every day. Like it was nothing, <laughs> but what I did know was Southern California was very saturated with clubs, uh, beach clubs, Northern California was not. So I, when I came up, I knew, I, I knew that I could get high school volleyball, beach volleyball cranking up here. Like there was, there was, there was a need and room for a club. And so that was a huge reason why I moved up. I said, okay, like I can make this work if I can start a juniors club and do the Cal assistant job. And so that's really, it was kind of hand in hand. Like I couldn't, you can't live up here on 30,000 right. a year, you know? So um, that was kind of like what I, what I had my mind set on. And so that's what I've been doing ever since. Yeah. How's, uh, how's your club doing then? Great. I mean, we have a bunch of kids. I mean, it's grown so much in the last four years up here. Um, some of our We've had, we've had good players come through uh, Northern Cal in the past, but now it's getting deep. Like we have this two, 2023 recruiting class um, is awesome. And yeah. so it's, it's pretty cool to see. Yeah. Is it trickier now, like being head coach? Because I'm sure that you can't, just with recruiting laws and whatever, you probably can't be super hands-on with it anymore, right? Um, yeah, you definitely have to walk a fine line at times. Um, 
a bunch of coaches do it. Um, Stein runs a club, Steve Walker, Arizona runs a club. Um, you know, like a bunch of, I think Brooke Niles is at least involved in a club. Um, there's advantages, there's disadvantages for sure. But yeah, you, you have to know the compliance rules and there's some things that you can't do. Yeah. And I feel like the NCAA compliance rules are, are not as easily read as like a Harry Potter. <laughs> they're complicated. No. And they're like hard to find. It's it changed <laughs> all the time. Um, yeah. Basically you have to assume that you can't do anything. Yeah. Right. And then try and find <laughs> a reason to do it or the answer to allow you to do it. Yeah. Well, what do you think about uh, the new NIL thing? I haven't talked to any coaches about it yet. Um, yeah, I don't think anybody, nobody knows what's going to happen. I think a lot of athletes think they're going to be making money and a lot of them are going to be disappointed <laughs> to find out that, you know, I think a lot of them are going to be getting like free, free stuff, free t-shirts right. or whatever. But I don't know. I mean, just doing department zoom calls with everybody and listening to, you know, compliance talk, AD talk. Um, nobody knows. I think everybody fears that it, it honestly could be uh, the death penalty for NCA as we know it. Like it could completely turn it upside down and, and ruin it, but um, we'll see. That's why I feel like the NCA doesn't want to make any, you know, grand statements on this is what we're going to allow. This is what we're not there. Everybody's kind of just saying, all right, yeah, we all agree that they should be getting paid. But like nobody wants to put their finger on it and say like this is how it should really go. Right. So it's it's an interesting time for sure. Yeah. Um, it's uh it's everything's changing and evolving so fast. I mean, even since you took over as coach, I mean, just like how much has changed just in the college game, the beach game, and then how the college sports landscape is getting turned upside down and flipped over. Yeah, you know, it, it's obviously always going to start with football, basketball, the major revenue generators. Um, and then everything else will trickle down from there. But I don't know. I could see NCAA football just totally doing something outside of NCAA. They're already kind of doing that um, with the whole FBS. And yeah. So it'll be interesting. Um, hopefully it does, doesn't destroy our system um, because, you know, with, with our sport, it's like incredible for our sport. But I don't know it's uh it's a little bit worrisome yeah we'll see we'll see how it goes when uh when do you guys get back into um fall training hours so um again uh if i continue on if you get hired yeah we would start uh september so school starts mid-august we usually give them a couple of weeks to you know move in and get settled and then we start beginning of september okay so what does the rest of your summer look like? So you, you're not, I saw on Instagram that you're not actually going to Tokyo though. Yeah. So, yeah. So we had, you know, we finished on Sunday, um, celebrating our Olympic birth, going to Tokyo, you know, all the emotions that come with that, as you can right. imagine, you know, uh, and then the next day I'm trying to get answers as to, okay, now that this is happening for us. Like, when do we go to Tokyo? What do we have to do? Like, I have no idea what this process is like. And then didn't hear anything. Next day, didn't hear anything. And then finally, on like the third day, which I thought everybody was just still celebrating, whatever. Right. Trying to figure it out for themselves. And then the third day, I get a message that's like, this isn't good. Um, but I don't know that, like, you aren't on the list. And I'm like, what? What's a, what list? Right. Like, what do you need to do to get on the list? <laughs> right. What are you talking about? But as I've learned, there's something called a long list. And that is a list that um, every country's Olympic governing body. So like USOC or in this case, Moroccan National Olympic Committee um, has to submit a list to the games organizers of everybody that they can think of that would potentially um, go to the Olympics. So so the Beach Volleyball Federation has to submit that list. Okay. Every sport has to submit that list to the governing body, and then they send it on to whoever's running the games. So the long list usually comes out, I guess, months in advance. Um, of course, I wasn't going to be on that. But then the short list, which is just a trimmed down version, 
um, get sent out, I think beginning of June. And none of the, only the athletes, the Morocco officials only put the athletes on there because they thought that it only applied to the athletes when you're supposed to literally put every everybody that might potentially go so like right. physical therapist uh sports psych any trainer coach like whoever wants to get a credential to go and have a bed in in uh tokyo yeah needs to be on the list so come to find out i'm not on that list and they're like you're not on the list like we, we can't get you on the list i'm like okay so i start reaching out to sean scott Jason Lockhead, like everybody with some knowledge and experience in this whole process. And then right away, you know, Jason's like, oh no, that's not good. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just, it was like a, it was just a, a slow evolving nightmare from that point on. And so I spent the whole day trying to figure out, um, you know, like, what do I need to do? What are my options? And, uh, you know, and then here I am, I guess, still maybe holding on to a little bit of hope that a miracle can happen. But yeah, I mean, because I'm not on the list, I, I don't, I don't get to go. And so they're without a coach. They don't have, they don't have a physical therapist. Like they're oh all my alone. Gosh. It's so crazy. It's, it's beyond frustrating, but you know, I'm, I'm like, I don't know what stage of grief I'm on, but you know, <laughs> right. a few days now, but yeah, it's, it's crazy. Well, I'm still in there. I'll be in there with in denial with you. There's like, it just blows my mind that they wouldn't let a coach be edited on like one more person. Yeah, I know. It's not, it's like, and from what I understand, the, the national governing body has to be the ones to add you to the list. I'm like, that's run by Moroccan people. Like, why would they not want their own team to do well? But who knows, maybe there's some stuff that I don't know about, or I'm sure there is, that maybe it's impossible and it's really not just somebody's decision. I don't know, right. but it just seems like they just add me to the freaking list. Right. Like, how, am I ever going to get this opportunity again? Who knows? Yeah. But, but at the same time, they've had a coach for six years and he doesn't get to go. And that... And it's frustrating. And the, and the team has to go by themselves. Like, it's just, uh, it's a nightmare. Yeah. I, I think that's one of the craziest parts is that the team has to go by themselves. Yeah. Because, like, I mean, navigating any Olympics is, is hard, but navigating COVID Olympics has to be insane. Yeah. Just think of, you know, like, just logistics alone. And then practices, scouting, um, just having somebody there as, like, a voice of reason. You know, yeah. with like in crazy times, like there's going to be so much going on that I just feel like you need, you need bodies there. You want comfort. Um, I can only imagine you want people around you that you're familiar with that can be, you know, a calming voice, come up, come up with a, a strategy, a game plan. Like I feel for them. I'm going to see what I can do from, you know, thousands of miles away, but yeah, it's crazy. It blows my mind. It blows my mind, but you know, had I known there was a, uh, a stupid list. <laughs> yeah. Well, hopefully you can get on there, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I guess the only, I think consolation is that you can't be in the box anyway, yeah. coaching. So whatever you could do via zoom, I, you know, maybe it'll help. <laughs> Trout, I got to tell you that that brings me to, uh, something else. I don't know if we have time, but just like what it was like actually at the tournament was absolutely crazy. I bet. So you say you're not allowed to coach in the box, which yes, you're not allowed to coach in the box. <laughs> but, so I go, I go in and we're, so I have no idea what to expect as far as like this tournament, but actually some of the players were telling me that there's everybody coaches. Like, it's just, it's crazy. So uh, the first match ha is going on and, and I'm just in the stands quiet. Like I'm not in the box. I wouldn't even really want to coach because I think it's distracting. Um, but right away, the other coach is just between every single point screaming from the stands, like, like calling their names to get their attention. So they look over to give them the next like play or like whatever, you know, like he wants them to do. And I'm like, I'm like sweating because I'm like, this is somebody, people see what's going on. Like we're going to get in trouble. Like what, like, what are we doing? 
So I'm like quiet and then, but everybody's doing it. All the, all the coaches from like all the teams, um, everybody's yelling and everybody's speaking in their native dialect. So it's like, you know, Arabic for us and whatever for the other countries. But yeah. um, so then, so then the president of our federation after, you know, the first match of day one, she comes up to me and she's like, you need to, you need to give them uh, advice or whatever. And so I'm like, oh my gosh, all right, here we go. So then I sit next to the other coach and then I'm just telling them, hey, we need to be serving <laughs> number two or whatever. And I think, like, I don't know, but I think he is saying it in Arabic to them, like yeah. screaming it at them. And like, whether or not they can hear you, like there's constant chanting, music playing and whatever, yeah. like who really knows, but um, and then from that point on, like, I'm just, I'm yelling as much as I can, <laughs> yelling from the stands, but knowing that, I, I mean, I was more of like the pump up guy, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you got it. Good job. Uh, or when pressure was, uh, mounting, you know, calm down, like relax, right. like you guys right. got this <laughs> again. Like, I feel like if I'm barking instruction to anybody, it's just a distraction, but, um, but then we're, we're even, in one of the matches, I'm warming up the second team while one of the teams is playing. I'm warming up the second team. And I won't say what country, but we're playing another country in a women's match. And I see their coach who's behind, right next to where I'm warming up my team, is looking and stealing signs, which is like the worst thing you can do, right? right. In beach volleyball, anybody that knows, like you can't give away a blocker's, blocker's calls. But like very very obvious because right in front of me and looking around somebody and then giving the giving the calls to the team oh so i'm like this is like there are no rules to this like it's a dog eat dog every man for themselves like no holding back it was it was quite the experience but um yeah and then just fights breaking out off court because oh, I, I don't even know why but it had something to do with that like coaching and being allowed to do this that uh coaches walking by their players <laughs> out in between games <laughs> coaching them very obvious um, it, it was absolutely crazy and i'm sure uh i don't know i'm sure it happens elsewhere but i've never in all my experience in volleyball <laughs> i've never experienced anything like that it was crazy i bet I figured when you took the job, I, I think you probably knew you were you were coming in for a wild ride, whether you knew what was <laughs> what was coming. Yeah. yeah, that was the that was the pinnacle. The big crescendo was seeing somebody else steal our team signs and then having to call them out. Yeah, that's bad. It's bad. Yeah, I mean that's like the number one thing in, in beach volleyball that you just can't do. That's like taking the Astros to a whole new level. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, well, so I guess you're kind of sitting on uh, two bits of, of potentially big news, whether you get on that list uh, and then whether uh, Berkeley hires you. So big couple days for you here. Yeah, it's been stressful, honestly. But, uh, you know, I it's all pretty much out of my control at this point. So, you know, if I'm going to – if I'm going to preach it to my players. I got to also own it in, in the difficult situations that I'm in. And I got to just control what I worry about, what I can control. And honestly, with both at this point, it's out of my hands. So try yeah. not to think about it. It's hard, but we'll see what happens. Yeah. Well, dude, uh, congrats on making the Olympics, whether you get to go or not. It's, uh, it's pretty sweet uh, what you were able to, to do with Morocco. And congrats on, on two first years at, at Cal is, is kind of like acting interim pseudo head coach. <laughs> Pretty good for, for uh, all things considered. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm really, really stoked for Morocco and it's the first time that they've been in the Olympics for beach volleyball, men or women. And uh, yeah, just happy for the guys, like just getting to know them, the, the women and men, I just feel, I don't know. I feel like a part of their family in a weird way, you know? And so it was cool to experience that. For them and just uh I'll, I'll be looking forward whether i have to do it you know over my computer at home um or in person i'll, I'll be looking forward to seeing them compete in the game yeah be cool yeah well uh well again congrats and uh wishing uh, all the best for whatever news you get uh for both morocco and cal 
Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll see. Yeah, man. Well, I appreciate the time. Uh, get some sleep, sleep off that jet lag and, uh, <laughs> good luck the rest of the summer, whatever, whatever's coming up. All right. I appreciate it, Trav. Thanks for having me. I'm going to give try a hard time right now. For not being <laughs> wake, wake him up. Wake up <laughs> All right, dude. Have a good one.